Welcome to The Lead, the New Lines Magazine podcast. I'm Amy Ferris Rockman, and this is a podcast where we delve into the biggest ideas, events, and personalities from around the world. It has been more than 10 months since Russia launched its full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Russia is clamping down on dissent in a way that we have not seen since the fall of the Soviet Union some 30 years ago. It feels like we are seeing a return to the Soviet era, when people informed on each other to the authorities. In a way, we are witnessing the destruction of two countries, Ukraine, which is being savagely attacked and torn apart by Putin's army, and that of Russia itself, where opposition to Putin's rule is being brutally crushed. Whatever happens in the war in Ukraine, Russia will be irrevocably changed. It now seems crystal clear that there is no turning back to having Russia on the global stage in either business or politics in the way it once was. Our guest today is Bill Browder, who is the CEO of Hermitage Capital Management, head of the Global Magnitsky Justice Campaign, and author of two books, New York Times bestseller Red Notice, about his time in Russia as the largest foreign investor, and his latest, Freezing Order, which centers on attempts to trace and freeze money extracted from Russia. Once a major investor in Russia, he is today one of the Kremlin's biggest enemies and a thorn in Vladimir Putin's side. The Kremlin has tried to get Interpol to issue arrest orders against him several times. Bill Browder, welcome to the podcast. Great to be here. Thanks so much. So, yes, as I just said, I mean, all eyes these days are on Ukraine and Western leaders credit the sanctions imposed on Russia for a lot of Russia's setbacks on the battlefield. You have a lot of knowledge about the effects sanctions can have on the Russian business and political elite. And exposing the web of corruption in Russia has, I mean, I would say, become your life's work. So could you please tell us a bit about how you got here? Tell us about the Magnitsky Act, if you can. Well, as you mentioned, I'm the head of a company called Hermitage Capital Management. At one time, Hermitage was the largest uh, foreign investor in Russia. We had about four and a half billion dollars invested in the country. And this was in the um, uh in the late 1990s and early 2000s. And we discovered massive corruption in the companies we invested in. These were companies like Gazprom, uh, Unified Energy Systems, Sparebank. These are all the big Russian state-owned companies. And as an investor, I felt both um, it was unprofitable and, and really um, immoral that these oligarchs and corrupt officials were stealing effectively all the money that should have gone to the shareholders. Mm -hmm. And so I started to do what, what, I, what, what are known as naming and shaming campaigns, where we would research how these what people went about doing the stealing and then share the research with the international media. And these campaigns, um, uh, remarkably, at, at, at a certain time, had a very strong effect. Uh, it was the time when we started this that Putin had just come to power. And he wasn't the same tyrant that he is right now. Um, he was very weak at the, for, at the beginning of his presidency. And so every time we would put one of these scandals out into the open, uh, Putin would, would, uh, uh, he, he would step in and do something. And so for a while, Putin was actually an ally in our fight against corruption, not because he didn't like corruption, but because he didn't like the other people who were benefiting from it when he was being effectively squeezed out as, as, a, as a weak president. And he, he decided to win his war with the oligarchs in 2003 by arresting the richest oligarch in the country. He arrested Mikhail Hordakovsky, the owner of Yukos, uh, put him on trial, sentenced him to 10 years in jail. And that brought all the other oligarchs under control who all said to Putin, uh, what do we have to do to not go to jail? And Putin said 50%. He became the richest man in the world. And that was probably the, the biggest turning point um, in Russia. So this guy... Uh, he becomes very rich, very powerful. He becomes the biggest oligarch in Russia himself. I was carrying on doing all of my naming and shaming, uh, but instead of going after his own, uh, going after his enemies, I was going after his own economic interests. And and I was expelled in in from Russia in 2005. Uh, I was declared a threat to national security. My offices were raided in 2007. Uh, I had a young lawyer named Sergei Magnitsky who. Um, investigated the office raids and discovered that the purpose of those raids was was to seize a bunch of documents um, of my from my companies that were those documents were then used to steal two hundred and thirty million dollars of taxes that we paid to the Russian government. Uh, 
He exposed that crime in a retaliation. He was arrested, uh, tortured for 358 days and murdered in Russian police custody on November 16, 2009, 13 years ago. And since then, I've made it my life's work to go after the people who killed him to make sure they face justice. And that's led to several important things. One is called the Magnitsky Act, which freezes assets and bans visas of human rights violators. It was passed in the United States in 2012, uh, in the Canada in 2017, in the UK in 2018, EU 2020, Australia 2021. There's now in total 35 countries with Magnitsky Acts. Um, mm. And we've also gone and said, well, who got the $230 million of tax rebate money that Sergei Magnitsky exposed and was killed over? And we've discovered it in many countries. We've engaged with law enforcement in those countries who in many cases have frozen that money, in some cases have seized that money. And um, as part of this whole thing, uh, we effectively found the Achilles heel of the Putin regime. These people uh, steal huge amounts of money. Um, and that money uh, is effectively kept offshore. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and this brings me to the current events, which is that they've stolen so much money from, so, from the country itself over a 22 year period. I estimate that the amount of money that Putin and his cronies have stolen is about a trillion dollars. Um, that, that it's created a, a, an impossible situation now for him because he, he can never step down. If he were ever to step down, he would lose the money, go to jail and probably die. And so as a dictator who's, and, and who's afraid of his own people because uh, eventually replacing him, he's got to just continue to up the ante and up the ante. And, and that's what this war in Ukraine is all about. It's, it's, it's an enormous war of distraction to, um, take people's anger, potential anger, either anger or potential anger away from him and, and direct it towards a foreign enemy. And there's nothing new about this type of thing. The dictators have done this, you know, through eons. Um, uh, and this is, you know, straight out of Machiavelli's playbook, the, the, uh, you know, start a war. And, um, and that's why, that's why we're at war today, which is all connected to, to my to these to this corruption and um and and one of the two ways of fighting the war one of course is militarily uh you know providing ukrainians with weapons to fight off the russians and the second is financially which is to starve putin of his financial resources and one of the ways which has been done which i think i, I i've played a role in is is if, if Putin's assets are held by the oligarchs, then those assets by the, of the oligarchs need to be seized or frozen at least, and then seized. And, um, and we're now in a place where, where they're, they've frozen about 40 oligarchs assets around the world. And hopefully at some point those assets will be seized. I mean, in a way it feels like the Magnitsky Act was almost a blueprint for what we're seeing right now. I mean, in terms of how the West right now, I would argue belatedly is imposing sanctions on Russia for the war in Ukraine. But I mean, since you have such a high knowledge and expert knowledge of exactly the effect sanctions can have on the Russian political and business elite, do you think how the West is acting is maybe a little bit too little, too late? No question, too little, too late. So here we are 22 years into Putin's um, criminal presidency. Uh, and this is the first time that we've actually done what needed to be done. And this is not the first time that Putin has committed grave crimes, re redrawn borders, attacked sovereign nations, killed innocent people. I mean, his entire presidency started with the unbelievable murderous invasion of Chechnya, where 50,000 at least civilians were murdered by the Russian military. He, he did that to raise his approval ratings. He invaded uh, Georgia in 2008. And by the way, there were no sanctions. There were none of this stuff. Uh, 2014 with uh, Crimea, and not to mention carpet bombing Aleppo and creating 5 million Syrian refugees. Mm -hmm. And um, all this stuff happened. And, and, and every time Putin did something terrible, people sort of you know, wagged their fingers at, at him and didn't do anything. And, and so Putin was basically uh, uh, understanding that he needed some way to distract the Russian people. He needed a good war. He needed an invasion. Ukraine was his target. Um, and he saw the upside of doing this, which was solidifying his power. And he didn't see a lot of downside in doing it because there never been any 
external consequences for him in the past. And so he, he just assumed past performance is the best predictor of future performance. And since the West had done nothing in the past, they should they probably do nothing in the future. And therefore, the rewards were there, but the risks weren't not so great. And he decided to go into Ukraine. And of course, he's 95% responsible for this decision. But I, I think that, that we in the West bear 5% of the responsibility because we effectively enabled him or encouraged him by not doing anything every time he did something like this before. I lived in Russia in those days, and you're right, with the exception of Western companies not wanting to do business or refusing to do business in occupied Crimea, there was not, uh, yeah, there was not much going on in terms of curtailing business um, in Russia. Um, absolutely not. In fact, it was encouraged. I suppose that brings me to the next question, which is you, you've seen Russia before in, in epic moments of, of change of time. You mentioned, I mean, you were there when Vladimir Putin came to power and, and the first Chechen war. What we're seeing now feels like a true cataclysm of events in Russia. I feel like we're at this really critical juncture. And I mean, how does this what how does this end? What is Putin's end game here? Putin's end game is not um, ending. <laughs> so he, right. he he needs to be at a, in war at war. This is the the probably the biggest misconception that most Western policymakers and politicians have is that there is some kind of end game that there's a negotiated settlement, that if he gets X and Y, he'll be happy and then we can all go and live in peace. I mean, of course, it's it's highly understandable that everyone wants to live in peace, but for him, the, it, he didn't invade Ukraine because of NATO or some grand vision of a Soviet or Russian empire. He invaded Ukraine purely as a, as a way of distracting his people, as a way of staying in power. And he needs to be at war. And so there's really only two ways that this this thing can end. It's either uh, Russia wins or Ukraine wins. And, and by the way, if Russia wins, that's not the end either. The, the, at that point, then he moves on to another place, let's say Estonia or Latvia. Right. And then we have a much bigger problem than we've ever had now, which is that we either have to go to war with Russia because those countries are NATO allies, which is horrible and inconceivable, or even worse, we decide not to go to war with Russia and to abandon a NATO ally and means that NATO doesn't work anymore. And so... That's just the worst possible set of choices that we ever could have to make. And so the other alternative is, is of course, if Ukraine wins. And if you look at the current reclaiming of occupied territory by Russia, Ukraine is winning. They, they've reclaimed 54% of their territory. Right. And, and, it, and if you were to project out on a linear basis, in other words, if you just say, how much have they gotten so far? How long would it take them to get the rest? Um, including Crimea, it's probably another two years. And so it's it's um, possible that Ukraine could successfully drive Russia out of their territory. And if mm -hmm. they do, um, that will be the end of the war. That will probably be, be the end of Putin because the Russian people can't handle their strongman to be a weak loser. That's the worst sin in the book in Russia is to be weak. It's like mm -hmm. a prison yard there. And... Um, and so given the, the two choices, which is that there's, I don't believe there's any chance whatsoever of a negotiated settlement. So given the two possibilities, um, it's, it's infinitely better for us if Ukraine wins. And that means that we have to give Ukraine the tools to win. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, in terms of Ukraine and I mean, just to put, to go back a little bit, um, I've been attending your Magnitsky Human Rights Awards in London for some years now. Um, they were established in 2015, right? Um, and they recognize journalists, politicians, activists in the field of human rights. Um, people like Senator John McCain and Jamal Khashoggi have been awarded. Journalists Maria Ressa, Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe. And I did notice that this year in November, um, and these were the first awards since the war in Ukraine began, you could feel a different mood in, in the room. There was this, this sadness, this tension in the room. And, and that's obviously because of the Ukraine war directly connected to it. Vladimir Kara Murza, a supporter of yours, who I've actually met at the awards, is now in prison in Russia for speaking out against the war. The wife of Alexei Gorinov, a Moscow city councillor, also now in prison for simply saying the word war. Uh, she was there and spoke there too. So how is this war in Ukraine impacting your work with the Magnitsky Act and also with the Magnitsky Awards? 
So I've been dealing with a singular tragedy since 2009 when Sergei Magnitsky was killed. And uh, it was a single murder. And, and in fact, it was at a time when there wasn't that much terrible stuff going on. And so we had, we had the um, opportunity to share what was happening on a regular basis with people who could pay attention and, and could care and could be outraged. But now we've got so many atrocities happening just left, right, and center, day in, day out, in Russia and Ukraine and all over, that it, it's there's this expression, this famous expression coming from Stalin, that one death is a tragedy, a million is a statistic. And that's what Russia is doing. That's what Putin is doing right now, is this statistic. He's, he's inuring us to the tragedy of each individual story. And so from my perspective, I have certain uh, skills and certain talents that I've developed over this terrible 13 year period that I can put to use to try to help these victims, the, the victims in Ukraine, first and foremost, but also the victims in Russia, like my friend Vladimir Karamurza, who is an opposition politician um, who was standing up to Putin, who went into, back to Russia after the war to protest the war, who's now facing 24 years in prison for, quote, treason. And so I, I can use these skills to try to help all of these new victims as best I can. And one of the things which I'm working on, which I think is probably the single most important thing, at least from within my skill set that I can help, is that since when the war started, uh, $350 billion of Russian central bank reserves were frozen, mm -hmm. like weeks or less than a week after the war started, which is, which is monumental. I mean, it's a huge amount of money, totally unexpected from Putin. And we're now at a place where I kind of foresee the West tiring of financially supporting Ukraine going forward. And I believe that this, the ultimate outcome of this war is, is gonna be um, based on money. Who's got the money? Do the Ukrainians have, continue to have the resources, the financial resources, the military resources to fight this war? Mm -hmm. And I think that the single biggest determinant of whether they do or they don't will be if we can repurpose this money, this frozen $350 billion and confiscate it take it away from them and give it to the Ukrainians to both defend themselves and to rebuild their country. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I'm working on. It's, 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 you know, in the world of 80, 20 rules where you try to tr try to, you know, focus on the thing that has the biggest impact. I think that I can have the biggest impact there because it's so material, it's so important, and it probably will determine what happens at the end of this war. I mean, that that's amazing that you're, um, involved in and already talking about rebuilding Ukraine. Is that very active in Western political circles? I mean, we don't hear a lot about it, about rebuilding Ukraine. There's a lot of focus on ending the war um, and making sure that um, Russia is defeated. But is there is there a lot of talk, a lot of plans at the moment to actively rebuild it? Absolutely. I mean, it, it, I, I would I would argue actually there's more to talk about rebuilding it than than finishing the war and getting this thing properly sorted out, getting the Ukrainians what they need to fix this and finish it. Um, I was just in Brussels at the European Parliament um, with a number of um, members of the European Parliament and even members of the Commission, European Commission, yesterday, um, mm -hmm. specifically talking about how do we get this money to the Ukrainians? And I'm doing the same thing in the British Parliament and the Canadian Parliament and the US Congress. And you know, unlike the Magnitsky campaign, which was very singularly me, um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of other really important and good people working on this from from the Ukrainian government, from the Ukrainian parliament, from the Western parliaments, um, from government, uh, Western governments all over trying to figure out how to make it happen. There's a lot of resistance because this is something that's never happened before. But there's also uh, the it's just the simplest, most logical and clear idea of how you how we can solve this problem, which is let the, let, if the Russians have caused the damage, let's make sure they pay for it. And and we have we're, we have their money in our custody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are you able at all to talk about the details of, of the rebuilding well, and what what was well, discussed? I mean, well, the details are, are mostly about how do you get this money transferred from freezing to seizing. That's mm -hmm. the uh, that's the key question. And if you go to sort of um, narrow minded officials in different governments, they'll say, "Ah, oh, it's impossible. We can't do that." And we you say why? Well, you know, there's no uh, statute of international law which allows it. Um, everyone enjoys sovereign immunity, 
um, or the governments, I should say, enjoy sovereign immunity. And my response to that is that um, so Putin has basically um, tearing up all international law to murder hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians and destroy their country. But we're going to be constrained by some old version of the international legal template. You know, we need to adapt laws as he's adapting his malice. Um, laws can't just be static. And and I'm going around to lawmaking bodies to tell them this. And and just like the uh, the in the U.S. law enforcement when they're fighting with mafia, the mafia used to run circles around them until they created the RICO statute, which allowed them to prosecute mafia members. And this is the same type of thing. We need to have a sort of modern day uh, mafia law for international justice, which allows us to seize that money, not just freeze it. And so that's the big challenge, the big hurdle that we're trying to overcome right now is is um, is to get people in a mindset to understand that laws have to adapt with circumstances and international law has to adapt with circumstances. And that's what we're fighting with right now. And and it's I don't think it's even a legal question. I think it's ultimately a question of politics. Is there is there the political will to um, upgrade our institutions to um, fix this problem so the Ukrainians can get this money? And my prediction is we will be able to because as the war goes on and as Putin commits more atrocities and as the expense um, continues to escalate, this is the only way to fix it. So talking about, well, freezing, freezing assets, freezing money, let's move to your latest book, Freezing Order, which came out in April. So like your first book, Red Notice, this also reads like a racy thriller. I really enjoyed it. So it took us around the globe, introduced us to a slew of characters from people in the Russian opposition, like Boris Nemtsov, who who is who has since been killed, um, and Vladimir Karamurza, and all the way to the Trump Tower in New York and Helsinki, where Putin actually singled you out by name in his first meeting with Trump. Um, I see your book prominently displayed in every London bookstore, and um, and I enjoyed reading it. And I I'm also intrigued by the timing of your book because it came out. Uh, not that you obviously had control of this, but it came out in the early weeks of, of the war in Ukraine. And did the timing of it give your book a new urgency? Because we are talking again about yeah, freezing freezing assets on both sides. Absolutely, it, it was it was kind of crazy. I, sp I spent three years writing this book. I started in 2018, and I finished in in uh, the summer of 2021. And this is a book about you know chasing the the financial resources of Vladimir Putin and. I mean, I couldn't have imagined that that that, that what, as as this book was going to come out, that the whole world was going to be um, thinking about how do you find the financial resources of Vladimir Putin, and so it, it it jumped immediately to the number one slot on the New York Times bestseller list, and I've been pulled from pillar to post doing public speaking about the you know the the findings and the situation and and what we've learned um, both in, in from, from the book perspective, but also more importantly from uh, Legislative and policy perspective that you know government officials and politicians all over the world want to want to want me to share my what I figured out over the last thirteen years as we've been tracing this money and and so I mean it was uh, you know there's no there's I should point out there's no money in book writing um, but there there uh, there's a hell of a lot of traction here from a public policy standpoint and and uh, and it's given me a real important um, platform to share my knowledge which I think couldn't have been more important in this time because I, I do, you know, that there's two ways you can fight the Russians. You can fight them with tanks, which I have no expertise in, and you can fight them in the banks. And that's that I'm one of the um, people in the world who knows more than just about anybody. And, um, and, and I am glad that I was able to, that I, that I have been able to, and I will be able to um, share my ideas and my insights as, as, as this fight continues. It's amazing timing. Um, you work a lot with the Russian opposition um, for, for various reasons, um, not least because you see eye to eye on many issues. But something I've noticed and something we're witnessing in the Ukraine war is a shift in how the world at large, but particularly Eastern Europe, sees and views the Russian opposition. The TV channel Dorjd or Rain just had its license revoked in Latvia. And there, there is a, a growing voice of concern, especially in the former Soviet countries of NATO and the European Union, that they're not, that uh, the Russian opposition tend to not be real opposition, that they still have imperialist viewpoints and that they seem to have sympathy also for the Russian army, 
Um, I mean, to what extent do you agree with that? Because I know that a lot of the opposition is vital for the work that you do. Well, the, the, the people in the Russian opposition that I work with are people like Vladimir Karamurza, who is as pure as the snow is white. Vladimir, he condemns in the most strong possible terms the invasion of Ukraine. He condemns the annexation of Crimea. He condemns the killing of, of innocent people. Um, and, and for doing that, he, and he called it a war publicly. And for doing that, he now faces 24 years in prison, which he is under arrest. And um, other people like um, uh, Mikhail Hordakovsky, who also publicly condemns all of these terrible things the Russians are doing. And, and so I think, I think it's, um, it's, it's a little bit unfair. I, I completely understand the emotions and the anger that, pe that people have against Russia. Um, but we, as much as we're arming Ukraine, which is the most important thing, the other thing we have to do is support the people who are opposing Putin for, for for invading Ukraine because the Russians are the Russian, you know, the, we, we need to replace Putin. We need to create a new s system there, and 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 the and we need the Russians who we we agree with, who are reasonable people, who are against this murderous dictatorship, to be. Um, we need to support them any way we can, and so um, it's you know we we can't tar every Russian with this, with that brush. We need to support the ones who are against these monsters. And 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 there are some very good, brave, unbelievably honest people who are absolutely on our side, maybe even more on our side than, than a lot of our Western counterparts, like Emmanuel Macron, who wants to give Putin an off-ramp and other things like that. And when you say we, do you mean the West or, or journalists? Yeah. Well, I think, I think everybody, the, 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 anybody who's who's oversimplifying this thing needs to understand that there are people um, who are violently or not not physically violently, but but forcefully op opposing Putin in every possible way. And they need our support. They need the journalist support. They need the government support. They need parliamentary support. They need every kind of support because those are the people we need to rely on to overthrow Putin. If we could just quickly go back to the beginning, I'm not sure if you know this about me, but um, I attended Sergei Magnitsky's funeral in Moscow when I was a reporter with Reuters. It was so intimate and small. And I mean, it wasn't big news then, as I'm sure you, of course, remember Reuters sent me. It was kind of iffy if I would go. And I was only one of two foreign reporters. And I definitely felt I was intruding on, on, on this family's very private and extremely sad moment. For you at that time, did you know then when you knew he had been killed in, in prison, did you know that his death had the potential to lead to the kind of global movement that it has? Could you feel it already? I had no idea that that was the case. I mean, as you say, it was a pretty small affair and there weren't that many outsiders there. Before he died, I couldn't get it even. I, I think I was able to get two articles written about him when he was in jail. Nobody, nobody cared. Nobody wanted to write about it. No, it was just, and so I, I, I mean, for me, that was the most scary part of the whole thing was that like, this was the biggest tragedy I could ever have imagined and would, would the world care? And right. it's interesting that you say that, that, you know, it was small, intimate affair, but if you look at the pictures, they've, they've, those pictures of him in his coffin and, you know, they, they've gone around the world literally hundreds of millions of times. I mean, those pictures have been published so, so many so many newspapers, so many places has become the, one of the biggest symbols of, of Putin's evil dictatorship. Yeah. And so I, I mean, I, I really, I'm grateful that the world cared. Um, I mean, and, and I'm kind of heartbroken to see that there's so many more tragedies and nobody cares anymore because there's just so many of them. We, we had, we had, once this thing started getting out there and people started to see what had happened and heard the story of what happened to Sergei and saw the images it, it really touched everybody, and it, and it and it and it's really so sad to think that other people have had similar experiences, other families, other victims, and that there's just so much happening, so many terrible things happening all at the same time that nobody can even give them that 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 you know moment of sympathy and that moment of of um, recognition of what happened. Bill Browder, thank you so much. I thank you. This has been the lead the New Lines magazine podcast. Bill's latest book, Freezing Order, is available in the US and around the world. You can follow Bill Browder on Twitter at Bill Browder and me at Amy underscore FR. You can read more about current events in Russia and Ukraine on our website, newlinesmag.com.
This week's episode was produced by Joshua Martin and hosted by me, Amy Ferris Rockman. For more like this, subscribe to The Lead on your favorite podcast app. Thank you all for joining us.